Welcome back, everybody. Um, I was talking about playing Dzinde Bingo earlier on, and I think Anthropocene has kind of crept up the rankings of the most mentioned phrase of the day. But still number one is circular economy. Um, conveniently, the next session is about the circular economy. It's called Designing for the Circular Economy. Um, the, the moderator is Amy Frearson, Dzinde's editor-at-large, and the two speakers are Andrew Morlett, who's CEO of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and Richard Hutton, who's a designer from the Netherlands, where we've already heard their streets ahead in terms of circular economy design. So Amy, over to you. This session is going to be looking at the circular economy and um, what that means for designers. So to start with, I think it'd be fun to do a little bit of a poll. Could everyone put their hand up if they know, if they think they know what the circular economy is? That's good, it's a good, it's a good amount. Okay, and I wonder whether at the end of this talk, it'll be the same as uh, what, what, what you're thinking now. And so, yeah, this sort of discussion is going to be really um, looking at how we kind of change our systems of production uh, to be more circular rather than linear, and sort of ways of thinking about eliminating waste and pollution and creating value for the planet. Um, first up, we have Andrew. Over to you. I'd like to take a few minutes talking about the circular economy, uh, a little bit about the story of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and uh, about the idea of a circular economy. It's great that so many of you have uh, some familiarity with it, but also talk about what its relevance is for design. And I think that uh, many of you in your thinking about the circular economy would uh, have a perception of it in terms of its relationship to a linear economy, I hope. Uh, we like to describe it this way. Uh, we like to think about uh, the comparison between a circular economy and a linear economy. And today's linear economy is, is very much about um, taking materials from natural systems, turning them into products, and using those products for a very short amount of time uh, before they're uh, wasted. And we need to use new more raw materials each time we make products, and uh, we tend to recycle at end of pipe. Um, that's the predominant uh, way of thinking about it, end of pipe. Um, we're trying to recycle and recover materials uh, that were never designed to be recovered. So the yields that we get from those uh, types of activities are very low. And the byproducts of a linear economy are um, quite catastrophic in terms of the levels of waste and the pollution that's created. And um, we've come to this in a way through uh, the evolution of the economy. We, we have, if you think of um, going back to the 1920s, we had at that stage uh, a light bulb that would uh, last until today, we've had, we actually have examples of light bulbs that exist, bulbs that exist that have been in continuous use for well over 100 years. And they're, in the 1920s, there was a deliberate decision by many of the uh, industry at that time to shorten the lifespan of a light bulb to 1,000 hours. And it was, it's a well-known case and it was um, well documented. There was a, a, a cartel created to, to make that decision so that they could get more throughput and uh, sell more light bulbs. And then we saw the evolution of the economy to uh, the creation of um, desire through marketing and the notion of uh, disposability and uh, that was put on steroids really in the 50s. And we saw this whole sort of idea of disposability being in in incorporated into the economy in such a way that it's now part of the fabric of everything that we do. Pretty much everything that we have in the economy today is is designed for short lifespans and disposability. Um, so there's no need for cartels anymore. It's, it's, it's a real thing. It just happens. And I think if we compare a linear economy to a circular economy, you know, think of it in terms of the difference between a line and a circle. On the bottom, we have a linear economy, um, which is uh, extracting value. It's, it's uh, value extracting and it's consumption based and it's uh, based on disposability and, and we have throughput through the economy. It's a very extractive throughput uh, type of system. A, a circular economy by comparison is a way of thinking of value creation that's quite different. Uh, it's, about re, it's about use and reuse as opposed to consumption. It's about material flows and continuous material flows and the use of products and, and services. In, in our thinking, it's, a, it's an economy that is based on a model that's distributed, diverse, and inclusive. So how do we actually think about creating products in systems that are appropriate for context, whether it's New York or New Delhi? 
And it's designed, uh, it's a, an economy that's based on three principles, designing out waste and pollution right up front. So how do we think in design terms that way? How do we think about keeping products and materials in use at their highest value for as long as possible? And actually, how do we think about an economy that is by design regenerative and restorative in nature? So how, instead of actually trying to recover value and mitigate the harm of a linear system, how do we design it into a, a economy right up front? So we think of the circular economy as a, a framework for system solutions. Uh, and we use this diagram quite a lot, and many of you may have seen it. On the right-hand side, we have technical systems, and on the left-hand side, biological ones. And we have a series of loops on this right-hand side, with the inner loops being the most valuable ones, where we keep the products and the materials in the, in the way in which they were designed to be for as long as possible and used as much as possible. And they, they are the, that is the most valuable space for, uh, for design to focus on, is how we keep those products in the system used for as long as possible. And if you move all the way out, we can see uh, maintaining pro prolonging life, reuse and re redistribution, refurbishment, remanufacturing. And the outermost cycle there is recycling itself, which um, many people equate the circular economy to be something like better recycling, but actually it's, it's a system's view of how to keep materials used and in use for as much as possible uh, at their highest value. And, and on the right and left hand side there in the biological sphere, you know, how do we, in the world where things grow and are metabolized, how do we actually think about uh, returning nutrients into that system and keeping those nutrients in flow as opposed to having them being flushed and lost uh, from the system. So getting back to the light bulb example and uh, um, this is uh, an example of, of, of Philips, in fact, uh, moving from the notion of selling light globes to actually now thinking of, of providing light as a service. And if you shift the mindset that way, you no longer have to sell light bulbs. You actually design uh, light as a service and you, the, the lights, uh, the bulbs, the fittings, the energy consumption is all factored in. And what you do is you provide lumens at desk, desk height for a service uh, contract. And that's happening at Schiphol Airport and many other places. So that's, a, that's an example of that shift. And just to touch on plastics um, and a bit about the foundation itself, what we are focused on at the foundation is really the acceleration of uh, the transition to a circular economy. That's, that's what we focus on. We're, we're about developing the idea uh, and the promotion of the idea. And plastics for us was one example that we chose. It's a small but important part of the work of the foundation. And what we wanted to do was to look at that in uh, 2013 and say, could we uh, design an intervention that is systems oriented, whereby we could actually nudge the global uh, system to both recognize the challenges of plastics as a linear material flow, uh, but also approach uh, um, the, the problem with a solution orientation and a vision for a system that can work, uh, whereby we not only talk about the problem, but we actually were creating the context for solutions to emerge. And we, we, we designed this really very um, uh, proactively in 2013. Uh, we did a, a, a very major piece of work, uh, which we published at the World Economic Forum in 2016, uh, which got more media coverage than any report ever released at the World Economic Forum. And it had the quote in it, more plastics in the ocean than fish by uh, 2050, and one dump truck per minute going into the ocean. And since then, what we've been able to do is to mobilize 20% uh, of the global industrial actors towards innovation for a system that can work, uh, and to put in place meaningful targets and time-bound targets against this vision that, that's now been acted upon. So. Go back four years, plastics wasn't an issue. I mean, it was an issue, but it wasn't in the public context. It wasn't seen as a public issue. And I think what we wanted to demonstrate through this exercise is that we could actually get to a, an idea and mobilize it globally at scale uh, around a vision that was quite different. Now, for design, um, design is at the heart of the circular economy. So we, we talk about restorative and regenerative by design. And we think that um, designers have an absolutely crucial role in that upfront thinking of products in, in systems. And we actually did a piece of research and we know there's 160 million designers on the planet, about 5% of the workforce. And what we're now doing is changing gears as an organization from the mobilization of the idea of a circular economy 
and the demonstration of global systems change approaches to engaging designers globally and reaching out to 20 million designers of this 600, uh, 160 million uh, to provide uh, tools to give them stories that are inspiring and create networks for them to actually uh, explore this topic and to exchange within. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks so, thanks so much, Andrew. And I think it's really interesting because obviously you sort of uh, you start with this kind of this three three sort of point thing that defines a circular economy. So it's about it, as a lot of people think circular economy is just about reusing, but also there's this sort of element of keeping products in use as long as possible, and also about regenerating natural systems. I'm intrigued to know sort of with all the sort of various companies that you're working with, and um, what are sort of are there any particular other sort of misconceptions around the circular economy that you sort of have to sort of battle against? I think um, what's been interesting is that, that we're, we're, we're starting to see the industrial actors waking up to this in a way that's really going to make a difference, we think. I mean, you've heard it through the discussions this morning, uh, getting the, the scale of change that's needed to address the global challenges we have through government action policy is going to be really difficult. We can't wait. We have to move ahead. Uh, there was a, Marcus made a comment about, you know, is it designers? Um, and I think we're saying that it's, it's it, actually it's a combination of things, but industrial-led action is important. And they're waking up. They really are. And we're now starting to see uh, companies competing on the basis of innovation towards a circular economy, which is really fascinating because it's drawing the, the industry towards that direction as the new competitive space. Great. Okay, well then, uh, next up we have Richard, who's going to talk a little bit about the circular economy and what it sort of means in design. <coughs> Thank you all for coming. Uh, well, before I want to talk about the circular economy, I want to briefly address the linear economy. <coughs> uh, sustainability has been part of my practice uh, all my life. I founded my company in uh, 1991, and uh, I'm one of the founding members of Droog Design, and we already uh, questioned mass consumption, and we were talking about uh, uh, recycling uh, with, uh, with irony and sometimes even with uh, sarcasm. Um, uh, and the linear economy uh, that, is, uh, uh, that started with uh, the in Industrial uh, Revolution two centuries ago, what we do in the linear economy, uh, we destroy the landscape to dig up uh, uh, oil. Uh, we process it in factories <coughs> uh, to make uh, fuel. And then we put it in our cars. Uh, we burn it in our cars. Uh, we get greenhouse uh, emission. And uh, the material, which took six million years uh, to, to get from plankton to, to oil, we burn in seconds. <clears throat> Four years ago, I was landing at, at uh, Schiphol uh, Airport around uh, Rush Hour. Uh, yeah, I fly too, I'm not a saint. But uh, the whole of Holland uh, got stuck in traffic and I saw the sight, I was getting really depressed, well, well at least uh, sad, uh, that, that uh, all these cars were using fuel while they were standing still. And the next day I sold my car and uh, since then, I'm, I'm cycling and using uh, public transport. <clears throat> and we're really addicted to this linear economy. Uh, there are 100 uh, companies on this planet responsible for 70% of all the greenhouse uh, emissions. All these companies are in the oil, coal, or gas business. Uh, and that has to be stopped. Uh, th this is the top 25, it's all the Exxons, the British uh, Petrol, the shells of this world, they are pumping up oil, it took the planet 6 million years to make, they pump it up, they make, turn it into fuel, and we all burn it. Uh, uh, Paolo Antonelli mentioned that we are facing a mass extinction, that is fucking true. I don't uh, agree with her that we have to design our extinction. I think we have to prevent it. Uh, we, there's still hope. I'm, I'm an optimist, uh, so we, we can chill, still change the tide. Uh, uh, circle economy uh, has no purpose if we are going to die anyway. Uh, so before that, 
we really have to end the linear economy. Now we are addicted to fuel. We all know these pictures from Paris. People were protesting because the fuel prices were too high. That's why they all went on the street. That shows how addicted we are to fuel. Uh, of these top 100 polluters, 80% of what they make uh, goes to uh, fossil fuel, and 20% of what they make go to plastic. Plastic will never disappear. We have to stop plastic. Plastic is the cancer of the planet. No matter what people are saying, that you can recycle it, that's bullshit. You cannot recycle it. There are 4,000 different kinds of plastic. PAT can be recycled a little bit, but all the other plastics cannot. Uh, I was very disappointed that uh, Ocean Cleanup uh, announced last week that they are going to burn the plastic they collect from the ocean. Uh, thermical recycling, as they call it, that's uh, window dressing, greenwashing. We have to stop burning oil, we have to stop burning plastic. This is what is causing uh, all the problems. This is what's causing all the greenhouse gases. We have to stop burning oil. Uh, we have to stop burning uh, the, 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 the Amazon and all the other forests. We have to stop burning. It's very simple. If we stop burning, uh, if we make the transition from uh, um, fossil-based uh, fuel to uh, uh, sustainable uh, power, like solar power, then we can use all the, the energy we need. Uh, you can use uh, solar energy, it has zero CO2 emission, you can use it as much as you like. Uh, talking about the circular economy, this is one of my favorite circles, it's the sun. It's uh, quite far away from us, but it's also pretty close, it gives us 1,000 times more energy than we will ever need. Even if we have uh, 14 billion people on the planet, this will provide all the energy we need. Uh, and this energy is getting cheaper and cheaper. Last week, the government of India canceled the building of 13 coal plants because the, the, the price of solar energy was cheaper than the price of coal energy. And that is fantastic news, eh? because the prices will even drop for further, and then we can use all the energy we want to use. And uh, the second thing is, I'm from Holland. Eh? Many tourists come to Holland for windmills, where we're still building windmills. We're doing it already for centuries. That is also free energy. Like the sun, it's free energy. We just have to harvest it. And uh, that is the way we can stop the linear economy. Uh, then I get to the circle economy, as you can see. This is a, a lamp I designed for Dutch company Moy. It's a lot of circles, really circular design. Uh, designed in 2004, before the word circular design even uh, existed. But uh, according to the principles of Andrew, this is also circular design, eh, because uh, you can recycle all the materials. Uh, 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 steel is very good recyclable. Uh, uses a LED bulb, uh, but I think uh, the most important thing of this object is that once you buy it, and you, s you, you want to keep it for the rest of your life, and you don't have to recycle it, you just keep it in the circle. Another circular design uh, I made, this uh, Damba Mak, designed in the year 2000, uh, made of plastic. I apologize for that. I will never uh, design in plastic again. Uh, uh, sold a million, so that's not good. Except for my bank account, maybe. Um, uh, but it's also, according to the principles of the circular economy, perfect design. It's made out of one material, so I don't mix materials. Uh, mixing materials is the most stupid thing you can do, because then you cannot recycle it. It's made out of PP. And if you just have a lot of PP, uh, polypropylene, then uh, you can recycle it easily. But the problem is we have 4,000 different uh, kinds of plastics, and uh, now we're adding bioplastics. And you cannot see the difference between a bioplastic or a polyethylene or a polyester or a polypropylene or whatever, which means that we only can uh, thermical recycle it, burn it, 
and then we are adding to the problem. Uh, according, uh, according to the circular economy, uh, when it's no longer in use, you can uh, get a, give it a sex, second function. Uh, so uh, after you drink out of it, you give it to your dog as a toy. Uh, so it fits perfectly in the circular economy. More recent, I uh, designed a Dumbo mug for uh, adults, the champagne, champagne cooler for Guidini. Uh, I think this is really more circular. Uh, the last five or ten years, you see... Uh, uh, the use of uh, expensive materials like marble and brass, uh, which is only because they are sustainable materials. They have, uh, uh, unlike plastic, they have a value uh, in itself. People will cherish the product and they will keep it alive. This can be recycled, but I'm sure nobody uh, who buys it intends to recycle it. They will keep it forever and ever. Uh, a chair with a lot of circles, you see I really am into the circular design. Uh, made out of also one material, no mixed material. This one is made out of recycled aluminium. Uh, but I'm sure if you spend 50,000 euros on one chair, you're not going to recycle it after the use. Opposite to uh, this project I'm going to show you now, it's the world's first uh, circular designed uh, airport, airport lounge. Uh, seatings. It's the first airport lounge seatings which is 100% uh, plastic free. I designed it for uh, Schiphol Airport, uh, the airport in Amsterdam. Uh, it uh, uh, looks like the most poor, uh, boring project I did in my life. It actually is the most exciting uh, project uh, I did in my life. It's fucking complex uh, to design uh, a thing like this. There are 22 molds in this. There was uh, hundreds of pages of what the airport wanted and not wanted in uh, a million configurations which was, uh, was uh, uh, needed. Uh, this object uh, is literally made from uh, the aluminium which is uh, uh, used for the current uh, seatings. Uh, the, the seatings itself are made uh, from uh, e-leather, uh, which is uh, a leather made from uh, waste from the leather industry. I would have loved to use leather made from palm trees uh, that's not mass produced. Uh, uh, I would love to have made uh, a leather from Algier or whatever. Uh, all these experiments are not available in mass production, but this is made from uh, waste from the leather industry. Uh, at the interior of the soft seating, we actually revitalized uh, uh, antique uh, and old techniques for upholstery furniture before plastic was uh, uh, invented. And we use uh, a mix of uh, coconut hair uh, or horse hair and uh, latex. Uh, and a, a wooden shell inside is also a very uh, traditional way to make furniture. Uh, we made sure uh, that it's uh, long-lasting. It's the first piece of furniture I designed uh, which can have uh, impact. Uh, so there are a lot of cars on an airport for cleaning and for transporting. And uh, the furniture damages because uh, it gets hit by all these, these uh, objects moving. And it has a sort of uh, impact protection built in uh, the furniture. So it will stay in the first circle. It will stay alive. Uh, it's very flush and clean, uh, so it doesn't get dirty. So uh, as soon as things get dirty, people all don't treat it with respect anymore. If I prevent it to get dirty, they will treat it with respect. It's perfectly repairable. With one screw, you can take off a part. So when an, uh, one element uh, is broken, uh, you can take it off and, uh, and fix it. Uh, these are the current seats uh, at the airport. Uh, Skipple asked me, yeah, we have between four and eight hundred of these seats which are in good condition. Can we also use them? Yeah, because uh, I'm a star designer, big ego, so uh, they were afraid to ask me. And I said, yeah, this is fantastic. Uh, if they are good enough, don't throw them away. And we, uh, we made a special support and we will also use uh, these existing seats to extend their life, uh, because this is really crap. It's a metal frame with foam around it. You cannot recycle it. You only can burn it. But at least we can extend uh, the lifespan. And we will melt uh, 
the aluminium from uh, the current seeds to make my uh, seeds. Uh, aluminium, uh, when produced from bauxite to uh, aluminium, takes a lot of energy. It's a bad product. Uh, and that's why all these factories are in Iceland and places like that where the energy is, is cheap. Uh, but when you recycle it, it only costs 5% of the uh, energy. My time's up, so I really hurry. Uh, this is a project which has impact. Schiphol Airport has 27,000 seats. Uh, this is not a virtual project. This is really happening today. Big project, big impact. All uh, the, the whole seating is made within uh, 80 kilometers from Schiphol Airport. That's like 50 miles. Uh, on the planet, it's just a small dot uh, 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 on the whole planet. This is my favorite circle. Planet Earth. Please have a look at it. And uh, Nobody here will get, uh, can escape from planet Earth alive. Everything we have is on this planet. We have to cherish it. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks so much, Richard. Um, I think sort of my first question, obviously the Schiphol Airport project is really interesting and it sort of highlights this fact that in the Netherlands, the sort of whole thinking about the circular economy is much more advanced than it is here. Maybe you can tell us a little bit, I know Marcus touched on it earlier about legislation in the Netherlands, sort of pushing designers and companies to be more circular. Uh, Holland uh, really, uh, really changed uh, in the recent years. In 2008, not so long ago, I uh, made my home energy neutral. Uh, I wanted a home with zero CO2 emission. Uh, houses in Holland uh, are all heated by gas. I took my house off gas, uh, uh, which I had to pay a penalty of 2,000 euros to get it off gas. I insulated it. Uh, I used uh, thermal heating uh, with a heat pump, uh, uh, solar energy. And 11 years later, it became government policy. In 2050, all the houses have to get out of gas. When I decided to put my house off grid in 2008, everybody said, you're crazy. And now everybody says, you're a visionary. So the landscape in Holland changed dramatically from me being crazy, which is true, to me being a visionary, which is also true. And so the, 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 the whole landscape uh, trans, uh, changed a lot in, in a very short period. And I'm very happy that the government, who we really need to make this transition, is part of the game. And, and Andrew, sort of from your side, how long do you think it will take and how difficult will it be to make the circular economy the new normal here? Well, I, I, I think the plastics example is, a, is an encouraging one. Um, and I think what we're seeing is, as I said, the the narrative has shifted dramatically. Um, you know, in 10 years now, uh, when we introduced the idea of a circular economy and tried to popularize it, uh, 10 years ago, it didn't exist. Um, if you do a Google search now, there's, you know, well over 100 million references. Um, it's part of governmental policy in Europe and in many other countries. Uh, we have companies, we work with around 300 of the world's largest companies who are actively in, you know, investing in the space, uh, competing, as I said before. Uh, we see this idea, that it, it's, it's a, what's interesting about it is, um, you know, the conversations this morning talking about uh, future worlds and, and imagining different futures. Um, I think we're at a place now that is starting to shift. There's a societal yearning for better product service solutions that they can actually use um, easily uh, because I think for most people trying to act within a circular economy today is really hard work and, and we know there are very few real examples of reuse and, and you know repairability is impossible uh, you know you, it's, it's easier to buy a new washing machine than get it fixed um, cheaper usually um, but there's a real yearning people want solutions we know you know in the climate agenda this is to get to one and a half degrees uh, in climate 45% of the solution space is in the way in which we make and use things. It's not just about 
renewable energy, and it's not just about efficiency, it's about rethinking systems. And it's around thinking now about um, you know, the, the, the intersection of biomaterials and fourth industrial revolution technologies are opening up all sorts of possibilities. So all of these things together, I think, actually present a, a tremendous opportunity. And, and I was you know, sitting here listening to the presentations this morning, really very excited about the conversation because all of the key points are now on the table and, and I'm seeing them in, in, uh, in all of the major conferences I go to, the narrative shifting. And it's about, you know, instead of barking at the problem, railing at the problem, you know, people who are able to actually affect the change, the designers of the world, are talking about solutions. And we're now trying to understand, you know, products and systems and the intersection of materials with new technologies. And, and that's really exciting and I think it's coming. And we already know pretty much where Richard stands on uh, plastics <laughs> based on that, on that presentation. But I mean... I mean, I'm a, worried about his dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's not uh, my dog, it was actually Michael, <laughs> my, Michael Young's uh, dog. Okay. Um, in you, I mean, we, obviously it was also a topic from, from this morning as well. I mean, how, is there a place for plastic in a circular economy and, yeah. how, and how does it fit? Well, I, I think this is, you know, this is what we've learned, um, that it's about, it's about products and materials in systems in context. I mean... You know, a, a, we have an enormous amount of, of petrochem-based plastics in the system now, and we need to focus on how to keep it in the system, keep it in the economy and out of the natural system. And, and, a, a, and it's about systems. It's about how we collect. It's about the way we use them. Um, you know, if you've got a plastic bottle, you could keep that for, you know, 100 years and just keep reusing it. Um, and, and that you know, plastics in and of itself is a is a amazing material it's light it's durable it's uh, and when we need to think about it in that way but we need to think about it as a material product in a system to keep it in flow in that system so i think the technologies are coming for uh, recycling chemical recycling that will allow us, allow us to go from polymer to polymer and keep polymers in flow but we also need to look at biosource bio benign biodegradable whatever the definition is compostable Plastics will continue to leak, so the things that are leaky should be in biodegradable, compostable materials. And uh, we need to get is such a from bullshit, a I'm sorry to say. I'm really getting upset. So I, I read an interview with the CEO of Unilever, one of the sponsors of, uh, of, uh, of your foundation. Yep. Uh, he was also an advocate for plastic. Plastic is fantastic. Uh, glass is uh, very bad. We have to use plastic. It's a fantastic material, lightweight. We don't need, uh, use a lot of uh, uh, energy to produce it. Uh, so uh, you're advocating uh, your sponsors. Everybody here in the audience, I'm really sorry to say, you have plastic and chemicals in your blood. Yeah. No exception. The water I'm drinking now here, tap water from London, has plastic in it, this glass bottle, which lasts a hundred years, will, after three or four months, start to release plastic. So you can use it for a hundred years, but it makes sure that you get cancer and all kinds of other diseases. Of course, you can use it. It will not fall apart, but its small particles will get in your body. Seven out of ten placentas of babies are polluted with plastic and chemicals from the uh, oil industry. And so we can say, one day there will be a solution but by that, we're extincted. Uh, so we, uh, uh, if, we, if we want to follow the Paolo Antonelli route, uh, raise your hand if you who's for, nobody. Okay, me neither. Uh, so then we should follow the plastic route. But otherwise, we should follow the route where energy is CO2 natural, uh, neutral. Uh, there is no, no uh, 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 green gas uh, em emission. And uh, the Unilever CEO said, Glass, we should not use, it uses a lot of energy. As soon as this energy comes from the wind or from the sun, we can use as much energy as we want. Eh? The more, the better. It doesn't matter because it doesn't have an impact on the planet. And that is the only real way we have to go. Okay. And Richard, if you, uh, as, a <laughs> as a designer, if uh, a client comes to you and asks you to work on a project and they seem like they're not particularly interested in the environment, you know, 
what do you do in that situation? Uh, do you walk away or are there ways to be circular even if the sort of brand or company you're working with doesn't understand it? Uh, that, that's the nice thing about uh, designing circular. You can design circular without the client knowing. Eh? So uh, I design circular and if it's not, if it's not, if the client put the, this, didn't put it in his program, I put it in my program and I design it in such a way that I don't mix materials. I design in such a way that they don't have to use glue. Uh, so there are ways uh, to get around it without it being a part of their uh, 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 brief because it's part of my program and I always include it. And what about sort of big, sort of designing at a bigger scale? What if we start to think about architecture? I know Richard, you've been involved in architecture project trying to be circular and maybe Andrew, you also have some advice for architects trying to be more circular in their buildings. Um, I, I I would say that um, we need to be really careful um, with the efficiency agenda of uh, if it's powered by renewable energy, we can do as much of it as we like. Um, we need to think about the systems approach. And buildings are, are a great example as well. I mean, 30% of the municipal waste is from construction and demolition waste. Um, we need to think about the design of, of buildings in a way that they can be refurbished without uh, creating all of this waste. We need to think about uh, the way in which they're, they're built and constructed. You know, can we actually use more componentized approaches? And we work with um, Arup, who also is a partner of the foundation and um, many other organizations in the architectural design space. And, and it's a very important topic. Um, and, and it has moved, I think, beyond just this energy efficiency and smart thinking, you know, not just, just looking at it from an efficiency perspective and starting to think about it in terms of, you know, how do we think about effective building design in, in, in context? And it's, um, I think there's a lot of work to be done, though, in terms of, of equipping designers with um, the tools to allow them to make material choices and, and to manage these trade-offs as well. I think we've run out of time, but uh, as a sort of an end note, just quickly, we've got a room here full of architects, designers, and people in creative industries in various forms. What can they do to be more circular? Super quick. Well, I, I think, as I mentioned before, I think it's it's about you know thinking of these issues of materials and material combinations and and product service systems design, particularly where they have a material component to them that you know to think about them in context and how do we keep these materials, components, products used in use and what happens to them when they finish their first life. Um, so I think it's you know that that systems thinking and I think it's also. Uh, you know, as we move to digital and we move to more and more into fourth industrial revolution thinking, uh, you know, how do, how do we move all of these things in that context and uh, in cities and, and, and how do we tell the stories of, of what a better future could be that is by design regenerative and restorative as opposed to just uh, a reductive approach to minimizing the harm of, of a linear system. Mm -hmm. I think that's all we have time for, but thank, yes, thank you very much, much, both of you. Thanks very much, guys. Um, this panel has emitted 25% more CO2 than it was supposed to, so we're going to have to shut it down now, I'm afraid. A uh, big round of applause for our, our panel. Andrew, if you could just wait here for one second. Um, it was a shame. Ellen MacArthur is the, the former round the world record-breaking uh, sailor who started the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. We'd like you to take this to her because um, she's on maternity leave at the moment, so could, couldn't come. You were a fantastic stand-in. Um, but Ellen has put the circular economy on the map in this country. We didn't have time to talk about how 20 million designers can engage with you, but why don't you just give out your email address to everyone, and then all be in touch. Um, up on Google. And, um, yeah, and we're going oh to be working with the foundation to disseminate good practice about the circular economy. This is for Ellen. If she, wants, if she doesn't want to keep it, she can reuse it. Probably not as a dog toy, but maybe as ballast. Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you.